Hey everybody, welcome to day three of PowerShell Summit. My name is Justin Grody. I'm a data center solutions architect and Microsoft MVP. Happy to have you here with me. Uh, today I'm going to be showing you how to make a secret management vault for practically anything. I've been involved with working with the new PowerShell secret management module fairly early on. Uh, just because I saw it as something that fulfilled a need that I really had and so I wanted to get involved and help shape how it worked. And so I fiddled with, built a couple uh, extension vaults which you may or may not have used and I want to share what I learned with you today. So here's sort of the elevator pitch to start. If you don't know anything about secret management, this is what secret management is for. Secret management provides a way to retrieve and store secrets from many different providers using a really common set of PowerShell commands. Commands like get secret, set secret, get secret info, remove secret. You know, they're very straightforward what they do. But the idea behind them is that you don't have to get a specific key pass module and understand how that key pass commands work, which might be a little different from another module, which might be a different from a different module. It's just you have a common interface to store and receive secrets in your scripts so that you don't have to save them in the script. Uh, you can just go forward and make things work. So if you're a user, um, you can access those secrets from all these different vaults, whether you have, have them stored in LastPass, you have them stored in a Chromium-based browser, if you have them stored in any kind of location, that you need to get to those secrets. Rather than have to cut and paste them into your script, you can just use these get secret commands. And you can kind of swap and change as you need to. You can take a vault and change it for one for the other, but your script still works the same because your get secret command is still the same. And if you're writing a script or a PowerShell module, it gives you a standard way to ask a secret from a user and kind of let them supply it using whatever vault they choose. You can simply just do the standard get credential and let them supply it as a credential. Or if you need something more complicated like a certificate or something like that, you can either ask for a certificate and let the user provide it via get secret, or you can simply provide parameters like secret vault and secret vault name to your command and have your uh, script or module go and fetch those for them as part of the script. Their nice thing is that because you, uh, there are several vaults that allow for unintended uh, fetching of secrets, for instance, the Windows Credential Vault allows you to retrieve secrets because you're already logged in as the user and sort of your user profile is your key to get into that vault, then your scripts can run in sort of a single sign-on way where you just run the script, your Git secret is able to automatically fetch your key, and you're able to operate. Really great, really nice way to kind of have a standard way to get at secrets, store and retrieve secrets, and have them available. Currently, Vault extensions exist for a lot of different things. Officially, there is the local encrypted file, the Microsoft PowerShell Secret Store, which keeps your secrets stored in an AES encrypted file locally on your computer. There is the Azure Key Vault extension, which is provided by the Azure PowerShell team. That allows you to retrieve secrets from an Azure Key Vault, which is a specialized store that resides in Azure and requires Azure credentials to access. Uh, there is a module that I uh, modified that uh, allows you to access using the built-in Windows Credential Manager, typically called Credman. Uh, there is if you've used the original, excuse me, if you use the original like previews of secret management, that's kind of how it worked, and I just kind of brought some of that back. Uh, there are lots of third-party ones made by various community members. There's a key pass module I built. There's a one password, last pass, Bitwarden, HashiCorp Vault, all these different ways to get at these secrets. But again, you're still using the same commands: get secret, vault, my Bitwarden vault, or my last pass vault. And you can even, in this demonstration, I'm going to show you how you can use anything. In this case, I'm just going to use a text file, a CSV file, as my vault. And hopefully there will be more. Hopefully you'll see this video and be inspired to make another one. So I'm not going to go too much into how secret management works. So instead, I'm going to just wait here while you go watch this YouTube video up here by Mike, uh, who did a great job. And so you go ahead and do that. I'll wait. It's fine. All right, done with the video? Great, let's move on. So the a PowerShell Vault extension for secret management, thankfully, is fairly simple to implement. It is basically just a PowerShell module that implements a certain set of commands. We have a test secret vault. Uh, we have a get secret info, a get secret. Basically, you're just implementing the same commands that you would use in secret management. The way that this works is that when the user wants to do any kind of action, like they do get secret info, after your vault is registered, which basically all that means is that it puts the details about your vault into a special configuration file, 
whenever that command is called, like git secret for my, you know, my CSV vault here, uh, the git secret commands gets called, and then that just turns around and calls your method, or uh, excuse me, your command that you made in your vault extension. And so all the information kind of gets passed through. There's some additional parameters that we're gonna add to our extensions that are different than what the user sees that are just there to help the secret management module um, call our commands. Because the secret management module does some work for us. Like it handles pipelining, it handles uh, separating things out and moving things from one piece to another. It handles picking which vault to use if the user is to find a default vault. And we don't have to worry about any of that. We just have to take the secret information that the secret management module gives us to us and process it. So let's go ahead and get started with what that looks like. So I'm going to go ahead and bring up my secret management CSV module here. Uh, this module is on GitHub right here, which I'll go ahead and bring up. Switch to a different view here. Uh, you can find this module here as, again, just on my GitHub and find all the details there and check it out and work with it yourself. And we're just going to go through it. So over here on the right, I have a couple starter folders. Uh, I have a folder for my tests. I have a git ignore file, which just means I don't want this particular file to be saved. And that's why it gets grayed out. And the simple readme, which you saw earlier on the page. So what we can do is that um, under my folder here, source, I just named it source. You can name it secret management CSV. You can name it SRC. doesn't really matter. It's whatever just, you know, you like. I like source, so that's what I do. And then under here, I have my module. So this is sort of my base module. Uh, and so you hear here, I'm filled in a whole lot of information here. But this is, for instance, shows the module version. A uh, very important step here is listing our extension as a nested module. This is uh, how this whole process works, is that because it's a nested module, that keeps the commands that we're going to create hidden from our larger PowerShell um, view. Uh, that's what that's what'll allow us to define a command that just says git secret, but not have it show up and override the main uh, secret management command. Uh, so by making it a nested module, it just kind of hides all those commands. Uh, again, because this is just sort of a scaffolding, uh, don't have a lot here, just have which tags it is. But keep in mind is that the way that these vault extensions can be authored is that they can be made as part of a larger extension. So if you've made an extension for a vault, let's say Bitwarden, if you've already made an extension and you're the one who wrote all the PowerShell commands to like get and set the commands and do all that kind of work, you can just simply include the components to work with your extension directly in your same extension. So you don't have to make a separate secret management.csv.extension your secret vault extension can just be Bitwarden, if that's like the name of your secret or my, or my secret manager. And so that's kind of why it's structured this way. So then you have a folder here. It's very important that folder be named with this dot extension on the end. Otherwise, uh, secret management won't be able to pick it up. And then we just have, again, another, uh, another PowerShell module in here with our information. And so first we have this module manifest, looks very similar to the other one, lets us know where our root module is. And importantly, it's, it exports all the functions that our uh, vault supports. So maybe your vault, you don't want to support everything. Like maybe your vault's read only. And so maybe you'll leave off the set secret ones. Maybe your vault doesn't support metadata. So you'll leave off the set secret info one. But in general, you know, you'll pretty much have this same set of commands for any vault that you do that you choose to support. So then the main function, the, you know, the meat of your module is going to be in your PowerShell module. Now, if you wanted, you could put all the functions right here in this file. If you look at the examples that are on the uh, official repository, everything's just in one file. I tend to like to split things out into separate files, just like how I build my PowerShell modules, for a couple different reasons. One, it makes them really easy to test. Two, it makes things like pull requests and stuff when you're working in source management like Git. It makes it a lot easier to work with a file. Somebody can just work in a very specific file while somebody else is working in a different file. And we don't have to worry about our conflicts because we change the length of the file or put things or move things around. Um, so rather than have the functions directly in my in my list, I just have a couple commands that loop through all my private functions and import them, and then loop through all my public functions and import them. And for every one of my public functions, I name them the same as the command that's there, and then I go ahead and export those as my public functions so that secret management can work with it. Again, this is all very standard PowerShell module stuff, and if you read anything about PowerShell modules, there shouldn't be anything here that's a surprise. 
So let's go ahead and start looking through our structure of our, of our um, module. So here for each one of these, I have different commands that basically represent the exact same command that comes through. So when I wanna get a secret, I have a get secret and I define it as function get secret. I have my commandlet bindings, I have my different parameters and these parameters are very specific to uh, the command. So like name, if you do a, if I look at my get secret command that comes from the uh, Microsoft PowerShell secret management, If I take a look at the help on that, can't remember if this has an online yet, I didn't think so. Let's do a show window just for fun. So if I look at the parameters on this, I have a name parameter and I have a vault parameter. And that's kind of all I have here um, for uh, saying I wanna get this particular secret. So what happens is that when you run that get secret command at that level, it turns around and runs this command. And it takes that name you supplied and gives it to my command as name. And it takes that vault parameter you supplied and gives it to my command as vault name. Now during the development, some of these names kind of changed. So that's why this alias is here. And it's just to kind of prevent mistakes. Like you did vault instead of vault name in your code, you put in vault instead of vault name. This just makes it so it works both ways. I've had all kinds of errors and bugs that I ran into, like I couldn't figure it out and I realized it was because I typed vault name instead of vault. So this just kind of saves me from some of those mistakes. And same here, this was originally vault parameters, um, but it's a passed to the command as additional parameters. So then in this case, um, I'm gonna have a lot of write hosts in here, which just simply show you what's going on when we run these commands. So this isn't something you would typically put in, but maybe this would be a write verbose in your module. This would be something that you would, just to kind of have verbose information to your user to let you know, hey, we're doing this thing. Um, first thing we wanna do is test our vault parameters, for instance, with this git secret. And so um, I just went ahead and made a different command. You can see that here in test vault parameters or in VS Code. I can right click this and go to definition and it will take me to that same file. And so this just simply has a couple things is when we define a vault, when we register a vault, we support can support certain parameters about the vault. Like for instance, in this particular case, we support a path parameter, which lets us say where our secret vault is located. Just where is this CSV file that we're gonna read and write from? You know, in a real vault, it might be uh, which particular tenant are using. If it's Azure Key Vault, you can specify what the Key Vault name is and which resource group it's in. Um, and then you might have some additional parameters, like maybe your vault has special parameters about you want to allow people to clobber vault secrets if they set a secret versus throwing an error. Any of those kind of preferences, it's anything you want to define because it just gets passed to you as a parameter and you can do whatever you want with it. But we want to make sure that people don't just throw in arbitrary commands and expecting them to work. So we just have a very simple check here on those vault parameters that came in and we just check each of them. And basically if the key doesn't match this default verbose parameter, which uh, gets passed in if somebody specified verbose on the command. And if it doesn't specify our special path parameter, we wanna go ahead and throw out a warning. And this just means that you probably registered your vault incorrectly. A way to kind of proactively avoid these kind of errors is to go ahead and uh, um, create a commandlet within your larger module here, like up higher, and maybe you make a parameter that is like register CSV vault, and then it does all that sanity checking for you. Because by design, the secret management module, when you go to register a secret vault, if you use the register secret vault command, it does zero checking to make sure that that vault actually works. The idea behind that was that to support like offline scenarios where you're configuring it before you actually deploy it. And so if you wanna have something that like checks it for sure, you're gonna to have to write your own command to like do all that checking for you and wrap it. You'll see that in my key pass module, there is a register key pass vault. And in my Chromium module, there's a register Chromium vault, which auto detects any Chromium based browsers you have installed and goes ahead and registers them for you automatically. So um, let's go ahead and step through one of these. So my get secret here, I also just went ahead and wrote some unit tests. If you're not familiar with these, this is just using a tool called Pester to write tests for my function. And I've really, as I've written more PowerShell modules, I've gotten to really like, rather than doing the debugging interactive or like doing in write commands, I like to write my debugging into tests. Because one, I'm like, if I'm trying to debug it, then I have how I debug it right there. And two, once I'm done with my debugging and figure out what the issue is, now I already have a test that, te that tests for that in the future. So I go and I break something somewhere else, this test's gonna let me know, hey, you broke this when you changed that other thing. 
So we'll skip a lot of this boilerplate, but in short, it basically just does a test for this. And uh, you know, before we start our test, we go ahead and we kind of create a fake CSV file. We copy one of our mocks, which you'll see here in my test directory, which is just basically, I just made a couple simple versions of what my uh, repository is gonna look like. And so we go ahead and bring that in and we go, oh, we get back to my test, sorry. We bring that in, we define a vault parameter thing as a splat so that I can just do this rather than have to do dash name, dash vault, dash additional parameter, just kind of saves on the typing. And then we have my actual test where I wanted to read the secret successfully. So first it gets the secret, it makes sure that the secret is of a type string, and it makes sure that the secret that uh, I fetched is the secret that I actually wanted. So let's see what this looks like. If I go to my debugger here, I have all this, and this is a special extension you may not have seen. This is an extension done by uh, Tyler, of the formerly the, of the uh, PowerShell team, now of the VS Code team, that lets you, gives you a really nice view of all your pester tests. And so I can view my test down here, and I can go ahead and run it. And if I'm lucky, it'll actually work. And so there it goes, it runs through, and you notice that it ran that little write host that I had in there, and my test passed great. Let's see what this actually did. So let me go ahead and start here, and instead, I'm gonna go ahead and debug the test this time. And so it does that, does all my initialization, and here we are, we're gonna step through. And so first I got my secret, it ran my secret command, and great, it fetched that secret, that's great. Its type is of a string, that's good, and secret123 is secret123, so that all works and that's great. So that's an example of, of sort of a quick unit test. And the, the thing about this too is that I'm not loading my entire module, I'm not testing it flowing all the way through that the command works from the beginning to the end. I'm just testing this one command that like my inputs match my outputs, my code works, and that you know there's nothing funky about this very small little test area. And so I'm just importing that one script file as part of this test. And so that's nice. So now I have that, I'm just gonna go ahead and restart my PowerShell session just to make sure my test didn't leave anything behind. It shouldn't, but sometimes that happens. And let's go ahead and go a little bit further out. So I actually structured this demo um, with uh, demo tests. So down here are my demo tests, and these are kind of what are called like integration tests, which basically just means like this is testing my stuff works like end to end or that the different pieces like fit together. So here's how we're gonna do this demo. Is my demo first imports the module, uh, goes ahead and uh, finds the module manifest and gets my mocks folder ready so that I can use these as part of my tests. I'm gonna go ahead and uncomment this, which is going to, it's just a fancy thing that will set breakpoints automatically on get secret, set secret. So the program will automatically stop whenever we get to one of those commands, which will make it easier for me to show you what's going on. Um, I go ahead and set paths to my pester temporary temp drive. I register these temporary vaults that are on that drive. And then after each t after we get done all our testing, I wanna go ahead and pull those secret vaults back out so that I have a clean environment again after my testing's done. And then before every single test I do, I'm gonna go ahead and take my example mock files and rewrite them every single time. That way, each of my tests, if one of them changes something, one test can't interfere with another test because the whole testing environment like resets every time. And because you know we're just doing simple like copies, this all happens really quickly. So let's start with our test secret vault command. Let's go ahead and start here, and let's go ahead and run it, debug it, and step through it. And what did I break? Oh, so I actually ran this previously because I in interrupted it, so it's saying it can't find these vaults because I had an issue there. All right, we hit a little hit a little snag there real quick in that my uh, let's command when I uncommented this lost the comment there too, and then that's why my error happened. So fix that, move on, and let's go. So uh, we have our test here. We can test a vault. We can either click run test here, or we can try running and debugging our test over here. I'm just gonna go ahead and click run test here. And so it's gonna run, and you notice this came up with this pause command breakpoint when we got to test secret vault. That's what this command did, which is just, Set a breakpoint on each command, and when it happens, do this fancy thing that has the dark magenta background and the yellow foreground saying pause on this point. So great. So we hit this breakpoint. We're kind of at a starting point. 
let's go ahead and run. And actually, before I do that, I'm just going to show you here the test secret vault we're calling is the outer test secret vault, the one that's being called by secret management, our environment, because we want to test this kind of end to end. We want to test it going into secret management, secret management, then calling our module, and then running through the process and then reporting back. You know, make sure everything works. So we'll go ahead and run. And then the next step, we now hit our actual test secret vault command. So we'll go ahead and step into this. And now I'll show you if I do command test secret vault, we're now inside the extension. So now we're using this internal one that secret management has turned around and called. And so we can see the information that's been provided. Our vault name has been given to us with Pester. Uh, we have some additional parameters here. Uh, the verbose, as we talked about before, and then the path that was provided. And that path comes from the registration. When this vault was registered here, you can see this vault parameters. I said I need to specify the path to where that vault parameter is, which is here with that test drive. So that's where that comes from. And then we have this additional parameter quick. Now, um, one nifty thing about um, these um, vault extensions is that you can define your own parameters, and these will only be seen by commands inside the module. So, for instance, if I have another module that's like get secret info, excuse me, another command that's like get secret info, one of the things that happens is that when you register a vault like I talked about before, like there's no testing done before it actually runs. So you may want to on like get secret info when it's first called, maybe you want to go ahead and just run test secret vault real quick. So you can just let your note user know, hey, there's these issues with how you registered the vault rather than it just failing with couldn't get the secret. Uh, if you look at my key pass module, you'll see a lot of that kind of stuff in action, but we're kind of keeping it simple for here. So now at this step, we're gonna go ahead and do this testing the vault. And so that comes out, great. Um, we're just gonna do kind of testing the path. So first, just a nice sanity check. Does this vault actually exist? In this case, it does, because our test path was true. And we can see here, that's good. So because it made it past that, we didn't return false, so we're moving on. And so we get another message saying, yep, that file does exist. There's that message. Uh, and then we're next step. Um, quick wasn't specified. So, you know, in this case, if I had specified quick, I just like, that's good enough. Like, I don't need to go crazy. I just know that's good. So we're going to do a little bit more detail check now. We're first going to read in the data from the CSV. Let's go ahead and do that. And now if we look at our CSV data, we have an object here. And so we have the three lines that are part of that mock that I created. I have my pester one, pester two, pester three. And if I go here in my mock, you can see there it is, Pester Secret, Secret 2, Secret 3. So great so far. So then let's get back to where we were in our process. And so now we want to check this. And so we're going to go ahead and uh, so that check was done. Because the data wasn't null, we didn't have to write a warning. So that's great. And now we're going to do a quick try. We're going to go ahead and see if this data can actually be read as a CSV. Maybe it's corrupt. Maybe I went in there and threw a semicolon in when it was supposed to be a comma. So I'm just going to do just a real simple raw check and basically try it. And if it fails, try will catch that and go ahead and write out the error that it's probably not a CSV format or corrupted and return false. So in this case, it's fine. We're good. This, this test worked okay. And so then we're finally just going to just do a final check, like make sure that my data is actually there. So if I look at my data, I can look at it here. Okay, great. The data is there. I've got it here and that's good. So now I can go ahead and return true. So my tested vault works great. So let's move on to our next item. So that's how, and in that case, as you can see, that's just how I implement test secret vault. I just made a function, added the parameters that are required and did whatever I want to do in here. Uh, this is the key thing here is that you can, when I say you can make a secret vault for anything, you can make it for anything. Because at this point, you can do whatever you want with the parameters that are given to you. You could just have it, I don't know, pop up a bunch of cat emojis on the screen and then that, that, that's your vault. Doesn't actually return a secret, just pops up a bunch of cat emojis. Whatever, doesn't matter. You can do anything you want. Um, but because that's so flexible, that makes it so whatever commands, if you want to draw, if you have like a C sharp library you're using, if you're interacting with a command line tool, all of those you can do as an extension vault. The extension vault just, you know, the whole interface just kind of provides the contract to what getting a secret looks like and what setting a secret looks like. And then it's from your choice from there to implement however is in, works for your vault. So let's go ahead and move on to our next one. So I showed that example before where I said, you know, that we're doing a test. So of course we want to test to make sure that it also tests that the fail works because we don't want like a false positive. 
So here I'm going to go ahead and test a vault that I created, which is this bad vault, and the path is not a real path. So if I go ahead and run this test, uh, we pause on that test secret vault. Here we go. Now we're on the inside. Uh, let's skip all this stuff because we just want to get to the point that's going to matter. I'm going to run, stop my breakpoint there. Uh, oh, because I didn't have it in debug. Let's try that again with debug. Run there. Run again. And now I'm stopping at my debug point. And so, okay, so we have this additional parameters path. It's not a real vault. As you can see there, it said not a real vault up at the top. And so if we step into this. This time it failed, so this time it's going to write an error and return false, which is what it's supposed to do. The way that the vault extension specification writes is that you're just supposed to return true if it works, return false if it doesn't work. If you return a terminating error, that's supposed to mean something went wrong with the validation, but not in terms of validating the vault. It's just, you know, some other unexpected thing happened. Um, so in this case, we just go ahead and write the error. And so our demo, um, kind of basically, this is kind of a little trickery, is that uh, we just kind of neutralize the error and then we want to make sure that we return false. That's great. And then we get what the last error was, which is that uh, vault not found message that was here. And we just do kind of a simple test. Does it match vault not found? It matches. So great. Our test works. So now we can move on to the next thing. So one of the first things you want to do with getting a secret is first just getting the metadata, that secret. Uh, the um, secret management is very important about separating, like getting information about a secret versus getting the secret itself. Because sometimes we want to you know, list secrets, but we don't actually want to return the secrets. And so that's kind of how this structured. So first we're going to try our git secret info command. So we're going to go ahead and uh, clear all the breakpoints for now and go ahead and do the debug test again. And so now we're at git secret. And so now when I run, I'm now inside my git secret info one. And so you can see here, it's that public git secret info that I created. And so moving forward, we have uh, more parameters here. So we have a filter parameter. And again, this is just whatever was specified at get secret info dash name. One of these cases, again, it's an alias. The name changed. It used to be name. Now it's filter. So again, what, however that works, I just put in the alias there to make it work. Uh, then what we're going to go ahead and do is we also get the vault name as before. And then we also get all those additional parameters. So again, I could do all the testing over and over and rewrite that code again, but because I wrote it into its own separate little command here, um, it's going to go ahead and call that same test vault parameters that I have. So I don't have to repeat myself and I can test that one piece of code. And if something changes, I don't have to go to the five different places that I've defined it and rewrite the code over and over again. So we do our test, our vault parameters test. Okay, that's great. Um, so we're going to move on. And so now we're at the point that we want to get our secret info that came up. And now we're going to go ahead and import that CSV at that path. And so our data came in. We got three objects. That's great. And so now we're going to go ahead and match our secret. And so since the um, since the get secret info didn't specify um, a filter, or I didn't specify a name, um, in this case, then the filter just automatically gets passed through as a wildcard. So when I do my comparison, I'm just looking at my CSV data which here, here's my output. And the CSV data, because I used import CSV, is now a table. If I do a out grid view, hopefully this doesn't blow everything up. And so there's my data in out grid view. It's just a bunch of PowerShell objects, because that's what import CSV does. And I'm going to look through these, and it's just going to re return them. And one of these, you notice, has metadata on it. We'll get to that in a second. Um, so we're just going to get where the name likes the filter. So since the filter is a wild card, it's just going to go ahead and return everything. So now, my secret info match has three objects and my CSV data has three objects. That's great. That's what we wanted. And these should be basically the same. Basically, we're returning everything that's in the vault. If nothing was returned, then we just, you know, we bail out. We say there was nothing more to return. So uh, no secrets were found and it just returns a silent result. So now at this point, um, what I need to do is I have the info that's in my format. My format. In this case, it's just a PowerShell object, but you may have like a class or something that represents your secret. I need now need to take that object and put it into this special kind of object called a secret information object. So if I go up to the top here, you'll see I went ahead and put a using namespace command in here. And as you can see here, the comment, all this simply means is that if you've ever like done classes, you would have to normally type Microsoft.powershell.secretmanagement.secretinformation here. 
but what by putting that using namespace at the top, it's just sort of a shortcut that says, you know what, just fill in that beginning part for me so I can make it easy. If you do any C sharp, you're very familiar with like this process with like using statements. So now I can just type secret information and secret type. Makes my code look a little cleaner. So I'm gonna go through each of my secret infos and assign them a variable secret info item, which I like to do, I like PS items. So when I see secret info item, I know that, oh, I'm working on an item through a loop. So it's just, it's an easy indicator for me. And so we're gonna do that, step into that. And so now I have a secret info item. As you can see here, it's my first item, my secret one, two, three. And it shows over here as well with the fancy inline value uh, extension. So first we need a name. And so we're gonna go and pull that name property off of there. And so now we got it, our pester secret, that's great. Um, so now we need to specify a secret type. So secret type is basically just an enumerator that lists the kinds of data that you can support. You can support string, you can support byte, you can, su byte's great for like holding like X509 certificates, that kind of thing that you later translate. Um, you can support secure string, you can do an int. There's a lot of different formats, but they're very specific. So for our vault, um, we're only gonna support string for the purposes of this demo. So we only support string secrets. And so we're just going to assume the type's gonna be string rather than look at our object and determine what kind of type it is. So then at this point, um, we can go ahead and uh, take the metadata that might be there and go ahead and add it. Metadata is fairly new, is very new in the most recent release. It allows you to get more information about a secret, like your secret may have some special additional information than just what um, the vault provides that might make it be useful to your user to be able to filter and sort and look into what's there. So in my case, I just have two kinds of metadata. I have a modified where I'm simply just setting the date time. And because date time cast to a string just fine, you see that that modified comes out really nicely. But I just, I'm gonna turn it back from that string into a date time. And then I just simply have a comment that if this secret has a comment, great. If not, it doesn't. And we'll get to the comments here in a minute. So now I have my little metadata hash table. And so now I'm going to use the constructor for this, which is this is just a .NET constructor using the new syntax. This is PowerShell 5 style syntax. And so we can see here the um, how I'm constructing it. I'm constructing it with the name of the secret. If I do secret information new, you can see the different ways you can construct uh, most of the time you're going to be using either this one, which is sort of the basics, or this one where you're also supplying metadata. If you don't support metadata, forget this one. So my metadata is just a hash table. That's very new in the most recent release that you can just do a hash table. You don't have to do some other fancy stuff anymore. And so I have my secret name, which is the pester secret. I have what type it is, a string. I have that it supports, uh, it's from this vault, my pester multiple entries vault that I defined in my test, and the metadata, which is that hash table with those two entries. And so now it spits that out. Now it's just gonna loop through that over and over and over again. And so when we're done, um, we end up outputting three secrets. And that's what we see here is that I wanna see that I have three secrets, which is great. If I run in debug here and skip to that again, uh, you know, it'll have the three secrets. So that's great. That test works, run it again. And again, you see the steps that it runs through is that we get our secret, Runner gets secret, grabs the secret info, great. So now we have an easy way to get generic secret information. So now let's move on to uh, reading very specific metadata. So we're still using our get secret info, but in this case, um, we're gonna make sure that the metadata is okay. So when I got my secret info, um, this is gonna run basically the exact same command as it did before, only this time we have a filter. So I'm gonna do my debug. And same thing, we're gonna get secret and then jump into our get secret that we defined in our module. And it provides all this extra information for us. We're gonna go ahead and get down to the part that we care about, which is the filter. Move on to that. So now this time you see our filter, pester secret three, matches our filter that we had on our name. So this doesn't just have to be a name. It can be wildcard, it can be a special syntax, like you could use OData syntax, you could use keyword query language syntax. Whatever style of filter you wanna use for your vault, you can. You just have to let the user know that's how they have to filter for your stuff. So this time, rather than get three results, we're expecting one result, just the one that matches that entry. And so when we look at our secret info match this time, we now only have one result, and it's that pester secret three. So great, and this time it's gonna do the same loop, do all that stuff, and we're gonna go ahead and step out of this function to get back to where we were. 
So now we have this secret info set, and as expected, it's just the one entry, and it's got that extra metadata on it, which is great. So now we're going to test that metadata. I want to see that the metadata comment should be, this one is my favorite. That worked. Great. I want to make sure that the modified is of date time. Yep, that's great. And I want to make sure that the metadata modified time matches the time that's in the file. So if I look at my multiple entries, I can see, okay, yep, there's that time that matches here. So this test passes. Great. So that's how that works, is just getting more secret info. So now we're going to get a little more complicated. So now we've got the very basic building block, which is just getting info about our secrets. So let's go ahead and move on to getting more detail about a secret. Let's actually get the secret itself. We know about the secret, but now we actually want like that password or whatever it is. So let's go ahead and run through what that looks like. Go back to my debug pane. Uh, I can go ahead and also test these here and run them and make sure they work. And you'll just see that these will all go nicely green in a nice pretty way. If I um, clear my vaults correctly, which clearly I didn't. Well, it's because I'm still running in the debug here. I got to bail out of that. All right, forget I said anything because I'm running my special fancy debug. Normally these will go green. Let's just pretend that's not there and just go get Tyro's extension. It's awesome. But for now, we're just going to stick here. Um, we're going to actually, I can do this different way. Forget it. Rewind. We can do the debug method of this. Hop through it just to show that it works. Hop through everything. And now that goes green. And it's because I was winning run, it goes into a different task. It's not interactive, blah, blah, blah. It's because of that special breakpoints that I have in my script. Uh, do the same thing here, test it, debug it, step through all this stuff, blah, 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 don't care. And that test goes green. Great. All right, we're moving on. So let's see what um, getting a secret looks like. I've lost in my own code. Keep going, keep going. There we go. All right, so we got all our secret info. We got our metadata. Now let's try getting a secret. So we're going to go ahead and debug this test. Just going to get our secret and make sure that the secret comes back as we expect. So the get secret, again, you're, this is going to get really monotonous because you're going to notice same stuff, name, vault name, additional parameters, really kind of common interfaces. We're going to test our vault parameters again. Um, uh, we're going to go ahead and load our data in because we want to take a look at it and find the secret we want. So, and then here's where things get a little bit different. So we're going to run to this point. So the first thing we want to do is see if the secret even exists. If it doesn't exist, then we don't need to go any further. We're like, hey, the secret doesn't exist, so, you know, it doesn't match. And we're just going to throw an error. And because I put a, um, it'll just go ahead and throw the error and move on. So great. In this case, our secret exists, as we can see here. So that's great. Let's just move on. Our, sorry, I should have shown our CSV data dot name is the list of three and then pester secrets in pester secrets. So great. So since that didn't fail, let's go ahead and grab that particular secret. This time we're doing an equals comparison. We want to get the exact same secret name. And just in case there was something screwy, this is a nice little test I like to have to make sure that we returned only one and one and only one secret because we're getting the secret data. And the way that get secret works is it doesn't let you specify multiple. So you only want to be returning one secret. It's just kind of a little sanity check. This should probably never happen, but if it does, that means there was something screwed up in our vault. And finally, we return our final secret. Now, I'm returning it here as a string, but secret management will automatically convert it to a secret string for me to keep it encrypted. And so we move on and our test completes. And let's just do that again, but we'll get to this point to show what that looks like. So after we get our secret, step through our get secret, that all does what we expected. So now at this point, our test secret is in a secure string, like I said. So first, we want to make sure it came back as a secure string. Great. And then what we want to do is we want to make sure when we convert it from a secure string that it matches the secret that's in the file. And when we run that, it does, doesn't fail. We are good. Test passes. Awesome. So you see, like we've already gotten a, a functional vault that we can get secret info and get secret. And all it does is read a CSV input, you know, and pull the information out. And that could be your vault. That's all you need. If you just want something that gets secrets, you're done. You test, you know, test that the vault works and then gets the secret. That's all you need. So you can quit here and move on. So now let's get a little bit even more fancier. What if we want to be able to allow people to create secrets using that interface and abstract all the other crazy stuff away from it? So that's what we're going to do next. So this gets a little more complicated here. So first, we're going to get a secret that exists, and then we're going to do a set secret on it to update it. 
and then we're going to get the secret again and make sure that it has changed. And remember, we have all that before all, after all stuff happening, so it resets these tests every time. So let's go ahead and see what this one looks like. Clear our breakpoints again and debug this test. So we start a get secret. Great. Uh, we hit our get secret again. We see that stuff happening here. And now we've moved on to our set secret. And now we're going into our set secret command. So here's the set secret, which is defined here. So again, parameter name. In this case, um, the actual secret. Now we accept an object here, but you need to do your own checking to make sure that it meets one of the types that your, your vault will support and throw an error if it doesn't. Um, if there's metadata to set, that's here. You don't have to implement this, um, but you, if, you may want to put something there to like throw an error that if it doesn't support metadata. And again, the vault name coming through, additional parameters coming through, testing our vault parameters, you get the deal here. Um, this time I have a very special thing here. I put in a trap here because Again, if you remember I said, if you throw an error in a secret vault, what that tells secret management is that something screwy happened that's not specific to the secret, just something screwy happened in my vault. In this case, I still want to be able to throw errors because I want to be able to just throw an error and not have to do a bunch of handling with it. And So what I'm going to do is that if any errors get thrown here, they just come back here, get turned into a non-terminating error, and then returns false, which is what the set thing wants us to do if, if there's a problem with a particular secret. Um, not maybe the best way to go about it, but it's just an easy way to make this kind of process work. So we're going to go ahead and move on. And so first, um, again, like I said, our vault's only going to support strings. So we're just going to see if the secret's not a string, we're going to throw an error, error saying only strings are supported as secrets. Sorry. And then bail out. So again, just a quick sanity check. In this case, it's a string, we are good, and so we can move on. So now here's another example of code reuse. Um, you know, we can see if our secret exists. So because we already have a command to check if our secret exists, I don't have to write all that stuff again. I can just call get secret info from there. And because we're already in the module scope, if I look at my get secret info, it's not the outside get secret info, it's my inside get secret info. So I don't have to worry about secret management doing a bunch of, of funky stuff to it. But because it's my inside one, I have to provide all the stuff as if secret management was calling it. I don't call it the same way. But this is all the information that needs to get that secret. We step over that. And now we're in get secret info because we're calling it from our other function. We're just going to run through it. It's going to do what it does. And I may have skipped. Oh, I didn't stop it. I should have done a step out at that point. So let's go ahead and bail out and come back. Bad demo. Bad. Now let's try that again. Bail all the way out. All right, so we get our secret as before. Move on to our set secret. And we get to our get secret info as we showed before. Only this time we're just gonna skip that part. And we're gonna get our secret info, that's great. Okay, so now we have a secret info result, and you see it comes back as that secret information object that we had before. So that's nice. We have a nice type that keeps everything nice together. So then we can see uh, we're going to take our result, and now we're actually going to set it. So we, again, if you notice this is the same, having the same pattern, it might be wise to maybe have a just a separate function that imports the CSV, does all the sanity checking, so you can just call that function over and over again and not have to rewrite it over and over again. I wrote them in here for simplicity, but if you were writing like a real function, you'll see my secret management key pass like reuses stuff all the time. So one, I don't have to rewrite it all the time. Two, I can test it in one place. And three, I can change it in one place. Uh, you know, you don't have to repeat yourself. Um, so my secret info does that. It... Um, uh, import the data. I'm going to get that particular secret again, and now I'm going to go ahead and update it. So because this is an object, it's my secret entry object, and if I look at it here, I have it here as a secret information object. I'm just going to go ahead and update the secret, and then I'm going to go ahead and change the modified date on it. And so now I have this CSV data object that's floating out here that I've gone ahead and modified the data on. So if you look at my pester secret object again, it's now not very secret, whereas before it was the other thing. So now I'm just going to take the whole thing and write it back down to this file. In fact, if I um, find this file, all parameters.path, little test drive. What did I do wrong here? It was the lowercase, so it's on my test drive, so I should be able to get content on this. Okay, so you can see the content currently has secret123. 
but I'm just going to go ahead and clobber it with this statement. So when I run that, it exports. And now when I look at it, same file, you see how that's updated. It's just because I deleted the whole thing and replaced it, basically. So great. And that's how we're doing set in our vault. Your vault might call an API. It might um, work with a special file. You know, there's all kind of, whatever, whatever you want to do to set your secret. It doesn't matter. It doesn't care. Just whatever you want to do, as long as you return true, that's all it cares about. So now that we have that, um, we also have additional metadata. And again, don't want to repeat yourself, as I say here, metadata. Hey, wait, we have another function that can do that. And wait, I already have a splat that I wrote earlier to make this easier. So I can reuse that splat here, this secret params. I don't have to write it again, make my code nice and short, and set the secret info. But this is going to do the same thing over again. It's going to pull in the thing, read it, and then set the whole thing again. So if I look here, there's no comment pre currently. My metadata has a comment, or it might not have a comment, but um, it, it has a uh, new date, I believe. Uh, well, in this particular example, I forgot this example, I'm not setting metadata, so forget what I said. That comes later. But anyhow, we uh, go through, we set our secret, and uh, we get our secret again. And that's where we get into this step to make sure that it's good. We read it, and it looks good. Get our secret as plain text, get it again, see that happening down here, and our test passes, because the secret matched, not very secret. Awesome. So updating the metadata, this is the same thing as I showed before. Um, I'm going to add a comment to say I think this other secret's pretty okay. And we'll show that metadata thing actually happening this time. So I'll go to, um, go ahead and debug this. We'll get to our set secret info. This time we're actually adding metadata. So if I get down to my um, metadata part, we can see that our metadata keys are there and then we have a new entry. So we just loop through the metadata and go ahead and set it. And then because we changed our metadata, I'm just gonna automatically update the modified date to be updated. And so now our secret entry this time, as you can see over here, as well as if I just hover over it, I think. Yeah, you can see that the modified date's up to date and the comment is there that a secret's pretty okay. And we just do the same thing. We just clobber the whole file by updating the metadata and our data is updated again. And now if we look at what was returned for the secret, keep going, Let's skip past this stuff. Our updated secret, we're gonna check that our updated secret worked. I'm going to do the get secret info and now we can see that the comment I think this secret is pretty okay should be I think this secret is pretty okay great and that our modify date should have been within the last minute which is what because we just changed it and so all those tests pass the sky falls you know everything's wonderful the confetti shoots we're doing great all right so um this same process, again, is just going to be here again. We're just going to go through two more examples. Uh, I can go ahead and set a new secret, like a secret that doesn't exist, um, that also has metadata. So just another variation on this whole setting process. And we just go ahead and go through. I'm just going to go ahead and... Uh, oh, we'll go ahead and step through this. we got time. We uh, have a comment here. Same thing. I think the secret's pretty okay. And this time, you know, we're going to do the set secret. We're going to go and end up in set secret. But this time, the secret's not going to exist. And so it's going to go ahead and create a new one. So if I get down here, keep going. Secret info result. Currently, our secret info result is blank. So we're going to end up with our else case here. I'm going to assume the data didn't exist. You know, here's a good example of a time like, so I'm taking this data and I'm putting it in a format that I know will work so that I can write it to the file. This is a good example of a time when like a class might be useful. If you make a PowerShell class for this, you can just cast the one thing to your class and let your class do all the validation, all that kind of stuff, and have that validation in the one place. You could also use a function. You could have a function that says convert to and, and do this conversion to make that work. But basically, in short, like you can take that and then use it everywhere in your code and have a very consistent way of making sure that your data is being um, written correctly, which is really important for things like secrets. Uh, you, and so we're going to go through, we're going to set our secret, 
And in this case, I'm just using an array list, which is just simply that what we're going to do is because we're setting a new secret, I don't technically have to read everything in and write it all back out. So I could append it to an existing one. But if I have like a really big secret, this is just sort of a faster way to append it as opposed to destroy an array and recreate it. I'm going to make an array list out of the stuff that comes in and then just simply add the additional record rather than have to destroy it and build a whole new one in memory. Not a big deal for a very small thing, but just an example of like if you have a secret file that has hundreds of thousands of secrets in it, this is going to make it go a lot faster than doing it kind of the old plus equals way. And then I got my CSV data here and we'll see in my CSV data, uh, my secret has been updated and we can go set our secret directly make sure all that stuff works get back through our demo up through all this stuff to get that the secret works and then do those same tests make sure that the comments a comment it is make sure that the modified date is less than a minute and we're great so one last example in removing a secret we're going to go ahead and go here debug this guy and let's see what removing a secret looks like. So we're gonna run. Again, our nice little catch thing is gonna catch us to our remove secret. This is again in our public. Here is remove secret right here. Getting really repetitive with this over and over and over again. Thankfully, it's the last time you gotta hear it, but the good news is you don't have to relearn it over and over. It works pretty much the same each time. And so same here, I'm gonna set an error because I really wanna be careful about removing secrets. If there's anything wrong in the process, I wanna bail as fast as I can so I don't accidentally remove something because I missed a variable or I had a null and the system didn't see it. And so we're gonna do the same thing again. First, we wanna see if the secret exists because there's no point trying to remove a secret that doesn't exist. And again, hey, wait a minute, didn't we already write this before? Yet another time when maybe a sort of like test secret command would be useful so that we don't have to have all this boilerplate here again. So we're going to do that. It's going to go. It's going to get the secret, get the secret, run through that. We're going to come back. And so we do have a secret result. It did match. So great. We do have something that we're going to result, re reach, ah, excuse me, remove. And so this is not going to match. My, this bailout point is not going to happen because the secret's there. Uh, we're going to provide the user a little information. Oh my, we're removing this secret. It's going to go away. And so the way that I do this remove in this case is I just read in all the data from the CSV. I just do a where object to just simply filter it out. So just I want all the CSV data except that line and then spit it back out so that it's um, fine again. So we'll do our git content. In fact, I probably didn't need to hard. I could have just done this. There's our file again. It's just on the test drive. And so we have our three and we're expecting pester secret to go away. So we'll step over this step. Uh, we'll step over that. We'll, send, we'll see when we export our CSV, grab that same file. Hey, look, pester2 is gone because we just filtered it and then we exported our CSV back out without the secret. And then at this point, um, get secret info. Whoops. So now we expect that our CSV should only have two entries in it. And if we uh, look at that when it runs, it's going to do another get secret info. Uh, you know, we can pause here to show that just take on faith right now because when I run it all the way should have count two. this test passes that means that there were two there and we're done and that's the construction of a secret management vault in you know about 35 minutes and so you can take this example and go through and just replace stuff you can just replace this with like bitward and add or bitward and remove or bitward and get and as long as you format it into those secret information objects that it needs, you now have a secret management vault that you can take and publish on the PowerShell gallery and have people use and work with. So um, one final thing I just want to show again here just to recap is that this is not a very complicated process as you can literally is just simply that uh, the user calls the command, secret management takes that command and turns around and runs your version of it and then creates it. So if you want to see an example of a command line version of doing this, I recommend Tyler's uh, uh, LastPass extension. If you want to see using an existing PowerShell module, which was Posh KeyPass, if you look at the secret management KeyPass, I took an existing PowerShell module that somebody had already written all the work and interacted with the C-sharp library to get and set secrets, and I just wrote a wrapper around that. If you want to see um, some real heavy like direct.net interaction, I recommend my Chrome Semium Vault. 
That's where I took an assembly that somebody made for reading secrets in Chromium browsers like Chrome and Edge, etc. And I just wrote a wrapper around that. That's a great example of that. Um, and again, you can just, uh, this is, CSV is just an example, just using raw PowerShell commands. I don't think there's a command I used in here that doesn't come with the base PowerShell command set. This is all stuff that's built in. There's no extra modules that I'm using. You know, this works with nothing else um, and, you know, no prerequisites. So uh, thanks very much. I hope that was helpful. And uh, coming up next is Anthony from Centino Systems, who's going to talk all about Docker containers, which I love. You'll see my little Docker guy down here. I use them all the time. I'm building stuff. It's going to be great. Look forward to it. Happy uh, PowerShell Summit, and see you next time.